Thank you very much, Joel. Well, 1 Corinthians chapter 4, perhaps you could keep that in front of you, and I shall pray as we uh, look at it. Father, as you speak this morning in the Bible, we pray that we would be listening and uh, hearing all that you mean for us today. Um, We thank you for preserving um, letters written to churches many centuries ago, and we pray that your purpose for them being here, we would hear, and we pray that we would understand and believe, and we would respond in the right way to you today. For Jesus' name's sake, amen. As we sit here this morning, um, my guess is there's broadly three categories of people uh, in this building. Uh, Some here this morning, I imagine, will feel very weak as Christians. Uh, There are plenty of people here, I I guess, who'll be feeling physically rather weak um, for all sorts of different reasons, Um, but many will feel weak as Christians. You you muddle along following Jesus, uh, but it's hard going, and uh, you're not a great Christian, and you know that, You just feel a bit feeble and frail most of the time. Uh, This morning, I hope there'll be a very important reassurance for you, if that's how you'd uh, think of yourself. Uh, The second group of people, I think, there'll be some people here who feel this morning that church is very weak. Some will feel themselves are very weak. Some will feel that church is very weak. Uh, You've come here this morning uh, from a very busy Monday to Friday. And you've done all sorts of hugely important activities. And here we are again, and you look round and you think, well, we're not much really, are we? We're not quite where we've been from Monday to Friday, which I think is probably really, really where it's at, so we think. And this morning, for, for that sort of person, there is a very important reminder. Uh, you may feel weak as a Christian, you may feel the church is weak. Uh, Some here, third category of people, will just feel that Christianity is very weak. Uh, You can't imagine how it really is the way to go in life, quite honestly. It seems so incidental to everything that's important out there, everything that matters. And this morning for you, there is a very important explanation of why you might think that. Uh, The Corinthians did not like weakness. They didn't like weakness in people, they didn't like weakness in churches, they didn't like weakness in Christianity. And Paul is writing to say that their version of Christianity and thinking is very like the world, or worldly. He writes to correct them, and in the first few verses he's just pointing out that their Christianity is worldly because it is full of proud superiority looking down their noses at other people. So when I, when I use the word worldly, what I mean is a Christian, for example, who thinks like everyone else in the world thinks. A Christian for whom being a Christian has really made very little difference to how they think or live. Paul writes, he says, you Corinthians, you are full of yourselves. And because you're full of yourselves, you feel superior to everyone else around you at church. And in particular, they feel superior to the Apostle Paul. They were judging Paul, and they were asking, well, is he dynamic? Is he impressive? Is he inspiring as a leader? And the problem is that none of those are the Bible's criteria for good leadership. So if you've got it in front of you, when he comes in verse 6, Paul says he's applied these things to leaders, to Apollos and himself. He says, what you need to learn is the meaning of this saying, which he quotes, don't go beyond what is written in verse 6. That is, don't judge by standards that are beyond the standards of the Bible. And anyway, he says, even if you are different from me, that is only because God has made you different, not because you're particularly special. It's true, isn't it? The reason anyone gets a bit above themselves, a bit proud and superior, is because they forget God has given them everything they have, whether that's possessions or their gifts or whatever it is. One of the problems is they forget God's grace. In verse 7, there's this series of questions, and he asks them because the Corinthians are thinking they're so special, they have this amazing gift or that amazing blessing as if it's to do with them. 
Paul asked them in verse 7, what do you have that you did not receive? Implied answer, absolutely nothing. It's all received. And so stop this proud boasting that pretends you're better than other Christians. All you have is by God's gracious gift. I remember being part of a group of Christians and the impression that one got as they taught and as they sort of led from the front was that the world was divided into three groups of people. Uh, There were the lost, people who are not Christians, there were the Christians, and then there were the super-Christians, the lost, the found, and the sort of super-special people. But of course, that's nonsense. There is no spiritual blessing that one Christian has that another Christian doesn't have. Gifts, of course, may be given out differently, but they're still by God's grace anyway. They're still by His gift, His graciousness, not by being special. If only I remember God's grace a bit more in church life, that will lead, won't it, to humility. I've received everything. If I think like the world in church life, that will just lead to proud superiority. Grace will lead to gratitude and dependence. Worldly thinking, says Paul, that will lead to self-sufficiency. Grace will be a great leveler in church, says Paul, but worldly thinking will only make you look down your nose at the person next to you and judge them. They'd forgotten God's grace. They'd also forgotten God's timing. Uh, I've got those verses the wrong way around, actually. It should be verse 7 for God's grace and verse 8 for God's timing. Let's just look at verse 8. It's a rather curious verse. Uh, He says... Already you have all you want. Already you've become rich. You've become kings, and that without us. How I wish you really had become kings, so that we might become kings with you. Um, There is no no greater thing in life than to be a Christian. I hope if you're a Christian you know that. There are many, many blessings, aren't there, that we enjoy now. The moment someone becomes a Christian, we enjoy total forgiveness of our sins. We enjoy the powerful help of the Holy Spirit living in us. We enjoy direction in life, purpose that the world hankers after. We enjoy a church family. We enjoy the privilege of talking to God, all made possible by the Lord Jesus dying on the cross. We're going to remember it a bit later this morning particularly. But there are even fuller and better blessings to come in the future. There will be perfect health perfect knowledge of Jesus, perfect satisfaction with him. Christians will rule with Jesus in some sense. And unless you're really clear on what is for now and what is for the future, you're going to get into all sorts of problems in the Christian life. The Corinthians, needless to say, were not clear on what was for now and what was for then. They seem to think that those future blessings were theirs now. They thought they had in the present what's really reserved for the future. They thought that already they'd arrived, spiritually speaking. Now, of course, they hadn't, but they thought they had. And that's why in verse 8, Paul is mocking them. He says, already you have all you want. Already you've become rich. You've become kings. The truth is their timing was up the spout. All you want, richness, ruling like kings, they're for heaven. They're not for now. Paul says, I really wish you you had become kings because that would mean heaven had begun and then every Christian would be ruling with you. Now, there are some teachings around in churches today that do expect now what is in fact reserved for the future, perhaps a certain state of health or a certain ultimate spiritual experience, whatever it might be. It sounds a rather silly mistake to make. But I wonder if, uh, if we too can forget God's timing because we may be more like the world around us than we realize. The world around us, it lives basically, doesn't it, for, for happiness uh, and for pleasure. I noticed in the news this week that someone was going for a skydive for their 100th birthday. There's a thought when you, when you reach 100. If there's nothing after death, that sort of makes sense. You must make the most of now because that's all there is. But the worldly Christian can think a little bit like that. Pack in as many great experiences into life as if there's nothing to come. In our home group, not so long ago, we did a little experiment amongst ourselves. If your neighbor was asked, if they thought you believed in heaven, do you think they say that you do believe in heaven? 
as they look at your life, as they judge all the things you do, would they think that you believed in heaven, and what would they think you believed about heaven? Would they think that you believed heaven was unimaginably better than anything on this earth? Don Carson said that many of us are well-to-do and comfortable with little incentive to live in anticipation of Christ's return. Worldly thinking forgets two things. God's grace, we think our blessings are because we're special, we look down on others, and worldly thinking forgets God's timing. Perhaps we doubt how incredible heaven's going to be, and so we live for now. Now, the particular problem in this chapter, as Joel helpfully said in the introduction to the reading, is that they're thinking like the world when it comes to their church leaders, and in particular the Apostle Paul. In their minds, Paul doesn't measure up. And so Paul, with tongue-in-cheek, writes 8, 9, and 10, the verses here, and draws a great contrast. Uh, Just look at verse 10. That's a good summary of the contrast. He says, if you think from a worldly point of view, obviously... I am a fool, thinking that a message about Jesus is really going to cut it. Contrast you, who obviously are so wise, because yes, you have a very sophisticated message, perhaps about Jesus, but I'm sure it's about a whole lot of other things as well. From a worldly point of view, Paul, well, I'm so weak, but you, you're so strong. In the world's eyes, Paul is dishonored. No one thinks anything of him, but you, Corinthians, you're really honored. You're really going places, yeah. But what is foolish and weak in the world's eyes, Paul says, is actually wise and powerful with God. Real Christian leadership, he says, is not great by the standards of the world. It is not clever, it is not strong, and it is not praised by all around. Two things, he says, then, about Christian leadership. The first is that real Christian leadership displays cross-shaped living. That is, it copies the suffering and life of Jesus on the cross. It is cross-shaped in its living. If you've got it in front of you, just look again at verses um, 8 and 9. Paul is as if saying, look, let's compare, shall we? Verse 8, that's how you think you are. Verse 9, that's how I am. You think you're fully satisfied and rich and you're reigning already, and how am I? Well, I'm like a condemned man he says. Verse 9, he says, well, I think he's meant to, do, we're meant to be thinking really about a Roman general who's returning from some military campaign. He's processing through the city in great success, leading an impressive display of his soldiers, a long, long procession, and right at the end of the procession are his captives, those that they've defeated in battle, those who are going to be thrown to the lions in the arena, and everyone will watch them die. And Paul says, God's put us apostles not as the general, but as the captives right at the end. We're condemned to die. That's the nature of Christian leaders. Paul says, there are the two images. You with your fullness and your richness and your reigning. Here's me, I'm a condemned man. Who do you think looks a bit more like Jesus? He carries on in verse 11. He says, leaders also will suffer like Jesus to this very hour. So where you think you've got so much in the present, he writes, already, here's what my life is like in the present. We go hungry and thirsty. We are in rags. We're brutally treated. We are homeless. Which would you say is more like God in leadership? Which is more God-like? At the cross, you remember Jesus was thirsty. At the cross, lots are cast for Jesus' clothes. At the cross, Jesus is brutally treated. As he lived on earth, Jesus had nowhere to lay his head. Who's more like Jesus, would you say? Just look at the end of verse 13. He sums up what he's saying. The second half of 13, see how he describes himself? Up to this moment, we've become the scum of the earth, the refuse of the world. Come for a meal at our house and... uh, In some countries, if I said that, you'd all come to a meal at my house today. I don't mean that. But say you came to a meal at my house and you swept up under the table after the meal and you look in the dustpan and you'd see revolting morsels of food with sand and dust and fluff and yuck. That is the scum of the earth. 
I think our house is probably a bit cleaner than that, but that's the idea. Refuse is a similar thing. It's the scourings after cleaning something. So you've done a huge wash-up of a massive, dust, horrible oven pan or whatever it is, and then you take the little drainer out of your kitchen sink. It's the stuff that's in there, the refuse of the world. Paul says, that's me. That's what I'm like in the world's eyes. Despised, rejected by men, familiar with suffering, just like Christ. And then verses uh, 12 and 13, he says, when we suffer, we also respond exactly like Jesus responds. Who does this remind you of? He says, verse 12, when we are cursed, we bless. When we are persecuted, we endure it. When we are slandered, we answer kindly. Can you hear Jesus in that? When they hurled insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Paul's point? Real Christian leadership, it is a million miles from what the world says about leadership. It's shaped like the cross of Jesus. That's what you see as you look at a Christian leader. There's a Christian family who are involved in local church ministry in a busy city, uh, not too far from here. And as they were going about their work, some other Christian workers came to the city to run a mission for various of the other churches in town. And these other Christian workers were friends from university. They'd sort of grown up together in their Christian faith. In the world's eyes, these workers who'd arrived in town were very impressive. They had many people come to their meetings. They were young, but they'd written books. They were a known name in the Christian world. And this family said that it was a really hard time while those workers were in town because they felt rubbish. There they were, stuck into a small work, which was not glamorous and very costly. And Paul would say, when you feel rubbish for those reasons, that's the real McCoy. That's cross-shaped ministry. I remember as a young Christian observing my church leader, I remember thinking, well, he's never really going to set the world alight, is he? I thought he was a bit feeble and a bit weedy. He didn't do any sport. His clothes were old and sometimes a bit odd. He was socially hard work occasionally, but he was the most steely proclaimer of the cross I've ever met, and his life was very like his Lord. Incidentally, if you're not a Christian, you're looking in today, you probably think, as I thought then, about Christians at large, about Christian leaders generally. They're weak and feeble characters. They're a bit quirky to take Jesus quite so seriously. They're just not significant in the big scheme of my ordinary life. That is exactly right. And our hope is that it reminds you of Jesus. He is weak, insignificant. He was eventually crucified. So when a Christian says, oh yes, I follow Jesus, we mean Jesus is our whole pattern for our lives. Real Christian leadership will display cross-shaped lives. But also, as we finish, real Christian leadership doesn't just display it, but encourages it in other people. Paul's not writing, which you may have thought at this stage, just to send these people on a guilt trip. He wants to change their lives by changing their thinking. And he does it all from the perspective of a father-child relationship. So no one is the, the father of these Christians in Corinth like Paul is. He's their spiritual dad, if you like. And verse 16, if you scan on down, he says, Therefore, because I'm your spiritual father, I urge you to imitate not the world, but me. I don't think there's any church leader who can quite say that to their congregation, but any cross-shaped message will have a cross-shaped life to back it up. And how are they expected to copy Paul? Well, verse 17, he's going to send them Timothy. And Timothy will remind them of what Paul's life has been like, presumably by what he teaches and also how he himself lives. And then if they don't change their ways, these Corinthians, Paul's going to have to encourage them by a strong warning, which is just the last paragraph there. Verse 18, Some of you have become arrogant as if I were not coming to you. Well, Paul says, I will come if the Lord is willing, and when I do, we'll see just how powerful those proud, arrogant people are. And we'll see if there's any real spiritual fruit from all their big words. So verse 21 at the end, what do you prefer? He says, shall I come to you with a whip or in love and with a gentle spirit? It's a good reminder, isn't it, by the way? Loving parental concern doesn't exclude firm words or discipline. 
I think it's true for me that the greatest growth in my Christian life, as far as I could tell, has often come after some rebuke from an older Christian. Uh, You never like it at the time. In fact, you hate the person for it. But I was proud, and they were right. God graciously taught me something. And Paul says, look, Timothy coming, it's your final chance. Are you going to change how you're thinking and living or not? And how you respond to this letter will determine how I come. That's what Paul says. So the whole chapter, chapter 4 here, has told us about Christian leaders. But as it's done that, it's told us too about our thinking as believers. I want to leave you with one question. The question is this. Will you embrace the way of the cross? Will you do that in two ways? Will you embrace it in church life and in church leaders? That is, will you be content that the cross, in all its suffering and shame, is the pattern for life in a church and for leaders? Don't get me wrong. That is never an excuse for deliberately sloppy standards of ministry. But we will want to be more like Christ than we want to be like society around us. And can I say, I think it's worth being aware, whenever we move from our lives in the world to our lives in church, the experience may well jar with us. That is, you you come from the workplace, or you come from an exciting Christian work elsewhere, or just from all the nice friends you have in the week, and you come to a Sunday, or a midweek meeting, or a small group that's small again, the chances are you will find it terribly mundane. The message about Jesus is pathetic, the atmosphere is ordinary, and the people are really very mixed and unremarkable. But the Christian person embraces that because God has arranged it that way deliberately. He's arranged it that way so that when someone becomes a Christian or someone grows as a Christian, we are in no doubt at all about how that's happened. It cannot have been any human brilliance or cleverness or skill. It can only have been God. That's how he's arranged it. God uses a weak message through weak people to show that he's the powerful one and he's the praiseworthy one and not anyone else. Will you embrace the cross in church life and in church leaders? And will you embrace the cross in your own life? The pattern for Jesus' life on earth was not a bit of glory now and a lot of glory then. No, the pattern for Jesus' life was suffering now followed by glory to come. The cross first and then the crown. And it may be some here just need to know that no Christian will experience now perfect knowledge or perfect holiness or perfect satisfaction or even perfect joy. That's what heaven is for. There are great blessings of salvation now. Of course there are. Don't hear me wrong. I've listed some of them. But the best is yet to come. Just as we can't have a message of the cross and leaders like the world, we can't have a message of the cross and a life that is exactly like the world around us. If the heart of the Christian message is God coming down in humility and shame, the nature of the Christian life is hardly going to be glorious triumph. If we proclaim a Christ who is despised and rejected, we can hardly be working hard to be strong and liked as the world will. So will you embrace the way of the cross? It's really asking, will you embrace the way of the Lord Jesus, who we claim to follow? Let's have a moment's pause and I'll pray. Paul writes, therefore I urge you to imitate me. 
Father, thank you that your purpose in this letter is not to shame people, as the Apostle says, but to help them and to change them. Uh, We so long in our conviction of wrong thinking, perhaps, how to be more like you and to think more like you. And we pray that as we continue to think on these things, you would be working in us to make us those who are delighted with your ways and with the cross of Jesus. Make us more like him in every part of our lives, for we ask it in his name. Amen.